So the Bureau of Land Management admitted to doing some things incorrectly the first time. Okay. They admitted to, uh, they said they had deficiencies in analysis, legal errors. Um, so they, they admitted they got caught. Um, and anytime you, you, uh, you lose a case, it's, it's pretty normal to pay, to pay legal fees. Right. Um, so there was nothing abnormal with, with the normal, with the legal fees that were, that came out of the settlement. Hey, everybody. Thanks for tuning in to the 435 Podcast. I'm your host, Robert McFarlane. And today we have part two of the Northern Corridor conversation, a follow up from our conversation with the Washington County attorney, Eric Clark. Um, I had today Holly Snow Canada. She's the executive director for Conserve Southwest Utah. This is their magazine, Protect Red Cliffs. Their organization is uh, a mission to protect the natural resources and the public lands and the amazing things that bring mostly everybody here. Um, That's their mission. Conserving water, um, protecting tortoises, protecting public lands. uh, That's their mission. And uh, we want to make sure we give you the full story on the Northern Corridor so that you can go and make your voice heard. Public comments are open until June 24th. So make sure you get talk to your local representatives, talk to the county, uh, reach out to Conserve Southwest Utah to learn out mo- learn more about it if, if you're opposed to the corridor. Uh, but we want to make sure that you're getting the whole perspective on it. So uh, hope you enjoy this episode. Thanks to our uh, brand partners, FS Coffee Company, Downtown St. George. Make sure you check them out. Uh, Tuacon Amphitheater. We're so thankful for their partnership as well. Blue Form Media, Real Estate 435. Again, we're real estate agents. We're trying to be as unbiased about real estate as possible and have a full discussion about what's going on in Southern Utah. So that's what our podcast is about. Enjoy this episode, guys. We'll see you out there. I did a a minimal amount of searching just about you, but I saw that you're an ultra runner. Is that right? (laughs) Uh, I don't know if I would say that. Pre-COVID, I ran one ultra. um, Okay. Yeah. But you like to run. I do like to run. I like to mountain bike. I like to hike. Yeah. Love I mean, that's what brought that's us why here. Every, yeah, everybody does. Kept yeah, us here for so long. Yeah. That's awesome. So you've done one ultra. Do you do you run marathons and stuff like that? Or that was just one of the things you did at a... So it was a, it was a 55K. So I think that's 32 miles, something. Oh, yeah. Something on that order. So ultra is anything over a marathon distance. But yeah. I just love trails. I love being out on the trail. It's a lot more interesting to me than being out on the road. Mm-hmm. Um it, it, you kind of get into a better mindset, um, yeah. settle in a little bit easier. It's not as road is always a little boring to me. Um, but trails too, are interesting yeah. and it's actually, um, I've heard it's better for your body because you're, you're working different muscles as you step on different rocks and yeah. kind of tread around everywhere. Yeah. Better. And then also probably a little more dangerous, a little more, uh, hard, a little more, uh, rough on the body and the knees and actually all I've stuff. heard it's, it's better because oh, really? it, it's, um, Forgive or me. a little more, it's easier because the, the row or the dirt is a little softer. Plus, um, you are s- using different muscles every time you step because you're kind of rotating a little bit. So yeah. you're not in, where on you're on the road, you're kind of doing the oh, same yeah. motion over and over and that over makes again. Sense. It's easier to get repetitive injuries. Yeah. That's at least what I've heard. I'm, I'm yeah. Well, cause my wife, um, she was a cross country runner in high school and, um, as a runner, just like the concrete, the asphalt's better than the concrete. Dirt's probably better than the asphalt. That makes a lot of sense. Yeah. So, have you? Were you a runner in college, or were not? Not really. It was got into kind of it something later. I picked up when I moved here. Actually, just oh, having nice. access to so many trails, and it it felt like why why not? Why not? If you move a little <laughs> faster than walking pace, then you can see a little bit more. And yeah. So, so you mountain bike as well? Mountain bike. Mm-hmm. So what, what brought you here? Um, I was looking for, so I, my background actually is in engineering. I'm a civil engineer and yeah. I was, uh, looking for what I thought I was ready to take a break. Um, I thought it would be a one year break, found a job out here. So my husband and I moved out, um, thinking it would be a, a one year kind of explore Southern Utah and then move back. And, yeah. um, we've been here for, for seven years now and, um, 
love, love Utah, love all the places that there are to explore and, um, yeah, picked up mountain biking, pick up running, all those do fun a lot things more outside. Yeah. Yeah. Met so a lot of really kind people. Yeah. That was my wife and I moved here. So I was born up in Salt Lake and then, um, traveled to, you know, lived in a couple of different places. And then we were in, ten, uh, for 10 years, we were in California and, my wife and I kind of had a similar idea in 2015 is when we moved here and we fell in love with the place and she got pregnant almost immediately upon moving here. So we figured, well, let's settle down here. And it was still significantly cheaper to live here than it was in California. And so it was a great place, but that, that changed very rapidly in a very short amount of time, all those things changed. So it's, it's, uh, we couldn't have made the jump now that we did back then. Um, obviously it's slightly less expensive than Southern California, but, um, it's rapidly approaching Southern California prices. Where'd you come from? Northern California. Oh, okay. Yeah. Where? The Sacramento area. Yeah. yeah. So what was that first gig job that brought you out here? We were working with the youth in the back country leading backpacking trips. That oh, sort of thing. that's cool. Yeah. It was a really, really nice break from being in front of a computer for my engineering desk job. And yeah. of course now I've returned to a mostly desk job, but yeah. I do get to go out and talk to people in the community a lot more than I did ever did as an engineer. So that part's really great. So a as an engineer, I mean, what are some of the tools, obviously with this particular project, if, if, uh, anybody's just tuning in, we're talking about, we're going to part two of the Northern corridor conversation. Um, have you found that conserve Southwest Utah, that engineering degree has come into a lot of use, I'm, I'm guessing, yeah, especially definitely. for this project, but uh, other projects as well. Is there other things that that expertise has kind of helped you along with? Yeah. So I think um, an engineer is trained to solve problems and yeah. trained to look at really complex things and put pieces together and try to figure out a way forward. And um, there are so many, the Northern Quarter Highway is, is one of those complex things that has so many different parties involved and has been going on for, for decades and is a really complex situation. Um, the same with, uh, what, with water in our area is a, is mm -hmm. a really complex issue of, of how do we, how do we keep growing and protect our, protect our community and our economy while making sure that we still have water resources? Yeah. So your title for Conserve Southwest Utah is executive director. Mm -hmm. So what is, maybe help me understand your role and then how did you, how'd you get to this position? Like what, what brought you here? So I learned about Conserve Southwest Utah pretty quickly after, after moving here in 2017. Um, I had heard about the work that they're doing to protect local public lands and started volunteering. I actually was involved in the 2020 public comment period for the Northern Quarter Highway um, and started to get to know the team that way and eventually um, got pulled into the executive director role. But my role is really is um, I lead our, our staff, our team, team of staff. We have five staff members mm -hmm. and I'm the interface between the board of directors who are all volunteers and our, our paid staff. Um, I'm the only full-time staff right now and we have a, a crew of amazing part-time staff who do do way more than than they than uh than compensated than for, we can yeah. give them mm -hmm. yeah so and so what um what draw what what drew you into the the conversation i i guess what what was it about the protecting public lands was there a singular issue was that the northern corridor issue was that was the main one well, so I saw that Conserve Southwest Utah was really the only local grassroots organization who was fighting to protect the precious places that that um, that drew me to this place and kept me here. Mm -hmm. So, so that just that alone. Yeah, someone someone who could be. I wanted to contribute to that. I wanted to help be another voice to protect these precious places. Yeah, and and how are, how. I guess um, the driving motivation to to push forward it was just protection of the places. It was uh, was part of the turtles a part of it. I mean, what uh, aside from recognizing that we have a limited land in Washington County that is even privately owned, um, maybe, is there a singular just 
not wanting development? Is that maybe what, what the thought was is slow the growth? What maybe what helped drive that? Yeah, that's a common misconception is that, um, Conserve Southwest Utah is actually is not an anti-growth organization. Okay. So part our mission is to protect our area's natural and cultural resources. Mm-hmm. And then this, the second half of that is to advocate for smart growth principles. Okay. And so we're for supporting our economy, continuing continuing to to make sure that we can can grow as a as a community. Um, but doing that in a smart way. And so a lot of that is based on some of the Vision Dixie principles that were established community-wide in Mm -hmm. 2007. Yeah, we've talked about this on the show a couple of different times, yeah. Mm -hmm. And um, our our vision is that, is, is yeah, is exactly that, that we continue to grow for future generations and support this place that we all love so much. And we do that in a way that, that protects our natural and cultural resources. Okay. So, um, maybe going back oh, through the history. Can yeah. I have one more thing? To yeah, add? please. Um, you can cut think... me off anytime. <laughs> you're, you, you're, you don't strike me as the type to jump in and, and cut me off. You can cut me off anytime. Yeah. So I think, um, another thing we do is we, so we, we have three areas, uh, three program areas. So mm-hmm. public lands protection, uh, wa- a water program and what we call our desert livability, which is kind of a smart growth themed program Mm -hmm. and our water program. So what we do there is we try to build a water conservation culture. Mm -hmm. And for those who, who, uh, who say that think that conserve Southwest Utah is anti-growth, I often tell them one, have you looked at our website? Mm -hmm. Have you talked to anybody from conserve Southwest to Utah? Do you know what what we do? And also we are for conserving for water conservation. Mm -hmm. I think the number one way, the easiest way that we could stop growth in our area is to not conserve water. Right. True. Absolutely. Um, so is that like the primary mission is the water? Our, our mission is to protect our area's natural and cultural resources and also to advocate for smart growth. Okay. And so as issues go, like priority of issues go, do you have like a, Hey, this is, this is our singular you know, biggest issue that we face, and then you kind of go back from there. What are those kind of priorities? Public land protection um, and the Northern Quarter Highway has been something that that we've been um, fighting for the for decades now. Mm-hmm. Um, Conserve Southwest Utah has been around since two thousand six, and um, so public land protection, conserving, uh, creating a conservation culture for water. And advocating for smart growth principles; those are kind of our main focus areas. So, when it when it comes to this, um, the corridor itself, I guess maybe what is the out, outside of maybe the the obvious? We don't want a road cutting through a conservation area. Um, what are you opposed to outside of just that that in particular point? Right, that it's cutting through a natural. Uh, national conservation area, particularly with the Northern Quarter Highway. Yeah, is that mm-hmm. what you mean? So the um, the Northern Quarter Highway would impact lots of lots of things. Mm-hmm. Um, so the the recent um, study from the Bureau of Land Management. Do you want to pull this just a little closer? Sure. So the recent study with the Bureau of Land Management showed that it would negatively impact homeowner um, property values in the Green Springs area, Middleton, Brio, and Warm Springs area. Um, and I, I, I noted on the last podcast with, with yeah. Eric Clark that you mentioned, well, they, you know, they, they should have known they should have done their due diligence. Uh-huh. I have talked to so many homeowners who, who the developers, when they were purchasing their home in the Green Springs area, flat out told them that no way the Northern quarter highway is not happening. Interesting. Interesting. Yeah. Um, the highway would also affect the highest number of historic properties and indigenous resources. So there, there's a, um, a, um, a petroglyph panel and some other areas of significant importance to, to a lot of the tribal, um, community members in the area. It would increase the spread of noxious weeds and invasive species in the area, um, it would increase the probability, the frequency, and the intensity of wildfires. Mm-hmm. And so that's because um, both it starts at the the construction phase of it, really, as they're building the highway, they're disturbing land that leads to more invasive species, more, you know, we all know these weeds just burn up 
so much faster as soon as the land is disturbed. I will. Um, say, I will say whenever I see because they they put this green stuff down when after they've done the you know they've moved a bunch of dirt around they'll spray this green it looks like uh, grass at first and then it turns yellow and then it just turns into like the worst kind of weeds right it's like two species of weeds and then that's it and then it it covers it's not even sagebrush it's like this weird pokey green bush Pop your bicycle tires yeah and exactly your dog's paws and... yeah yeah I, I i've never understood why is that what they're spraying down but um yeah i guess that's a topic for another conversation but i i, I don't i don't disagree with you on yeah it, well, think, it for sure is going to facilitate it at some bit but even just I, I can't help but think the development all over everywhere else and then the amount of wind that we have that blows everything around is that that's that's going to be uh, a second order consequence of any development almost anywhere. Would you agree? Yeah, I think what happens to, I don't know if there's, I don't think they're spraying weeds down, but I think what happens is that the the soil gets disturbed and instead of the, at the native plants coming back, now you have this fertile ground that anything that's flying, flying around. around in the air is really easy Landing to on it, yeah. okay. just pop right up. Um, so the other reason why wildfires are, are more frequent when you build a new road or a new highway is because it allows more people in and people are the biggest cause of wildfires. Mm -hmm. There were five wildfires, um, that cut through the Red Cliffs Desert Reserve in 2020 alone, and they mm -hmm. were all human caused. They were, um, uh, someone sending off uh, kids with fireworks. Mm -hmm. Um, it, and then a blown tire was another example and so you've got more people introducing more sources of potential fires. You have the cars going through that could have blown tires, could have sparks, mm -hmm. um, more invasive species. So, so uh, they, they've said that the, this recent report said that um, we may see fires as often as, as every five to 10 year return interval for any given plot of land, um, which is enough to... Uh, entirely devastate the Mojave Desert tortoise population. So another concern of the highway is that it would de degrade the recreational user experience. Mm -hmm. um, and of course, as a as a mountain biker, as a hiker, this is something that's that's especially meaningful to me. Um, there are equestrian users. There are bird watchers. Um, I know you said this area was, was just semi cool. There are a lot of people who would disagree. Um, there are a lot of horseback riders who use this area, mountain mm -hmm. bikers, hikers. It's right behind pioneer park. So it's pretty easily accessible for a lot of people in the community. Well visited. It doesn't, doesn't take, you can, you could walk there. You could hike there. You could ride your bike there from, from St. George. Um, so the highway would fragment two popular trails and impact 13, 13 others. And the Red Cliffs National Conservation Area gets over 200,000 visitors per year and contributes millions of dollars to our economy. Um, and, and that's the entirety of it, though, right? That's the entirety that's of the it. That's the entirety Correct. of it. Yeah. So it's not just in this in this in particular area. Correct. Correct. Yep. Yeah. And, you know, this we we know that so many people come to visit here because of the protected mm -hmm. spaces, Iron Man and other things where people come here because they want to explore. They want to be out on the land. Um, and Washington County said that in, I think in 2023, we had, or in 2022, excuse me, tourists spent almost a billion dollars in Washington County. Yeah. And most of them were here because of our recreation resources or yeah, our right. landscapes and scenic vistas. Yeah. And so we want to make sure that, that we're not um, destroying these precious places that we have and, and setting a precedent for, for removing the protection from areas that we've, we've cared about and protected for so long. And then the final impact that the highway would have is on wildlife. So there, there, it's not just the tortoise. Um, it is land that was set aside for the Mojave desert tortoise and mm -hmm. they're, they're listed as a threatened species, but it's also for 20 other sensitive species. There's, um, there's the Gila monster, there's mm -hmm. the kit Fox, there's some other, other important species. Um, but the, the, I would do want to talk about the tortoise a little bit. The, mm -hmm. the Red Cliffs population of the Mojave Desert tortoise mm -hmm. is seen by a lot of experts as a really important population in terms of survival of the whole, the species as a whole. Mm -hmm. um, the reason for that is they, they're really actually pretty dense here and mm -hmm. compared to 
other areas. And that density means that they're, they have a really um, strong genetic pool Mm -hmm. and that'll help this population and the whole species survive. And then we're also what's called the leading edge of the population. So we're kind of the Northeastern most population of the Mojave desert tortoise. And as the, the Southern tip, um, Gets, if, if it gets more and more challenging for the species in the, the southern area to survive as the climate warms or as the uh, temperatures change, then the northern, our tip, our leading edge is going to become more critical, more uh, more viable population and may may continue to spread north and maybe a, may the source of of the, the population as it continues. Yeah, as it, as it continues to grow. So am I wrong? Because uh, from what I understood, when I looked at the fish and wildlife, um, just information about the tortoise, that it goes, um, we're, we're at the edge, the, the northeastern edge, as you said, and then it goes all the way down into Mexico. Is that right? I believe so. So just thinking about, you know, as a whole, so you're saying as a whole, this is one of or the densest population of the tortoise it's one of the most dense areas Mm -hmm. yeah and so one of the things i had commented on is that there's 15 million acres of protected tortoise territory throughout that mojave desert area and down all the way to the california mexico border and arizona border and so thinking about you know make making this a, a refuge for the tortoise i think is something everybody is okay with. I think, I think, uh, especially the amount of protected land that we do have here that buds up right against the community. I don't think anybody really wants to argue that we, we don't care about the tortoise. However, um, looking at our County and the amount of development that's even possible looking at housing prices and, uh, the fragility, truthfully, the fragility of our own economic makeup. Um, I think, uh, Eric brought this up a little bit too, is development is one of the the main economic drivers of our county. And so thinking we're the likelihood of stopping people from coming here and having a people impact on those areas is uh, nowhere in sight of letting up. And, And I think even over the last three or four years, the demand has increased from, you know, California and Northern Utah to everywhere on the globe. And as a real estate agent, I see it. I I see it almost every single day. I get people coming here and they want to move here from, you know, every state across the United States. And then, you know, whether it's Canada or, um, we, we helped the family move here from Belgium, right? It's just, they're coming from all over the place. And so understanding that, that, that growth. So thinking about smart solutions outside of, if we were to rewind 20 years ago and the road was to be put in, um, as from what I understand, the the easement or the plan for that is supersedes the NCA, the con, na, the National Conservation Area. Is that the the plan was always to have a road? Am I misunderstanding that, or I think that's what Eric had said? Yeah, that's another common misconception. The road was never promised. Um, so if we go back to 1995, that's when the Red Cliffs Desert Reserve was established, and it was established Zone Three, which is the area where the highway would go now, Mm -hmm. um, the area north of St. George, that was established particularly to be managed for the protection and enhancement for tortoise habitat. Right. And that um, allowed, Eric covered this really well, he said, you know, it allowed for development in the rest of the St. George area to continue. It allowed for 300,000 acres in the rest of the county to, to continue. And so it was really this great compromise between, um, people who were who were really forward thinking at the time and who said we we can protect this area for the tortoise but also for ourselves it's an area where where our local community can go to recreate and enjoy being outside and and at the same time we can we can continue to develop our community and um as part of that establishment of the red cliffs desert reserve there was language in there that said that the zone three area, again, the area mm-hmm. that's currently yeah. proposed for the Northern Quarter Highway would remain roadless. Um, and so, and then we saw that again in, um, in 2006, 
the Washington County Growth and Conservation Act was uh, was proposed and and tried to pass. It didn't pass this time, but this was the first time where we we saw um, legislative language try to put a northern quarter highway route through, and it it. It, it said to establish a, a quarter between Diamond Valley and Winchester Hills. So essentially to move people to the area of the ledges so that mm-hmm. area could be developed more. Um, that failed. In 2008, it was, it was revamped. Um, it passed. And it was supported by the entire Utah congressional delegation and the Washington County Commission. It did not have the language about the Northern Quarter Highway or that route to the ledges that w- that had been removed. Um, so uh, the highway was not promised. Um, and then again in 2009, what happened was the National Conservation Area was established mm-hmm. through something called the Omnibus Public Lands Management Act. And so that it um, it created a conservation mandate, which is it's a uh, it's a little bit wordy, but I'll read it. It says that Red Cliffs National Conservation Area was established to conserve, protect, and enhance for the benefit and enjoyment of present and future generations the ecological, scenic, wildlife, recreational, cultural, historical, natural, educational, and scientific resources. So that that conservation mandate was was not compatible with with four lane highways. We did see in that same bill in the two thousand nine bill. Um, this language that directed the Secretary of Interior to identify one or more alternatives for a northern transportation route in the county. Mm-hmm. And so th- this is the the language that that we have a disagreement over with with Eric Clark and with Washington County. So it the way they read that is that that is evidence to them of the highway being promised. I don't see anywhere in there promising a highway i see that alternative routes yeah and it was in the county to identify one or more alternatives for a northern transportation route in the county Mm -hmm. it doesn't say you shall build a northern quarter highway through red cliffs nca it doesn't allow it to happen through the nca um it 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 merely guides the the department of interior to to look at different ways that we can move people east to west through town. Mm-hmm. Okay. So when he was, when he was talking early on that it, it was a conversation early is when the, when the reserve was set aside and the initial agreement was set aside, he said that that, that Northern corridor route. So this is 20 years ago, right? That Northern corridor route was, um, there was, there was some discussion of a road will be going, through this area, you're taking stance that that is not true. There may have been discussion at the time, but the the language in the Red Cliffs Desert Reserve when that was established specifically said that that area would remain roadless. Would remain lo- roadless. So throughout the whole thing, uh, throughout sections of of Zone Three, just Zone Three, Zone Three. So in areas there are roads obviously that existed beforehand, like Cottonwood Road, um, but it, it said. The rest will remain roadless. You okay. know, we, Red Hills Parkway also already existed. Mm-hmm. Okay, got it. So, the the main stance is to say the the national it's national, right? Natural, national, Con- national conservation area or that, NCA for the short. NCA the NCA uh, acronyms acronyms. So they're always they. <laughs> I, I did a whole. I had a, a rant about uh, acronyms the other day. Um, that that area was at that time supposed to be established as no road going through that's your stance and is that the the main argument that that uh is being discussed at this stage where where do you think we're at at this stage is that still kind of the position of the action the legal action against the county is specifically that so uh we so let me back up and maybe give a little history for people yeah, who, are, who are just turning it tuning in um so um the highway was not promised, and in but the Washington County has been pushing it for over since two thousand, mm-hmm. um, for over twenty years, and it has been rejected at least six times. Um, it's been the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service has repeatedly said that it would be biologically devastating for the desert tortoise. 
Um, the community has stood up in support of protecting the area and rejecting the highway. Mm -hmm. And um, it's failed six times, over six times. And yet Washington County continues to push for it. Maybe and that's why those developers thought there's no way it's going through. It, it, it hasn't gone through this far. So why would why would it ever go that way? Perhaps. Yeah. Horrible. They shouldn't have done that, by the way. I, I sold a house in New Orleans, New Orleans Springs. It buds up against where Washington Parkway went. And that was the hardest part about selling that house. As I said, no, there's going to be a road there. It 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 looks like a just a UTV road, but that is going to be a road. And then lo and behold, two, two, two years later, there was a big road there. But yeah, that was the hardest part about selling it. But any any developer making a guarantee that the road's not going somewhere is that's very bold, very bold for them to do. So I, I can understand uh, a lot of those residents maybe not having full disclosure on that. So I, I would I would argue that is for sure the case. My my only point I guess into that one, not to take it, take you off track, was that the Washington Parkway, that was something that was for sure going to be in, and then. Basically, at the end of Washington Parkway, where it curves around and where it's supposed to connect into the the corridor area, that relatively doesn't impact really any. There's there's definitely some views. There's definitely some some of that is going to happen, um, but it quickly goes behind the hill, and then it's it's there's no there's basically nothing around except for the trails in the open space, which I get, goes back to why you don't want a road there because there's nothing back there. Um, so I guess that was my position on. Not sure how it's really going to impact those those specific homes in those communities, but uh, I digressed. I'm sorry. Keep keep going on the history. Yeah, of, it begs yeah, yeah. the question of uh, it's it's such an outdated vision for a road. It's so, why are we pushing? Why are we spending? I, I millions do not disagree with dollars? you. That is, I, I I very often have thought that same thing. It's like it might have made sense at one point. Does it? Does it make sense anymore? Because I, I I still. I drive the route. My parents live in Coral Canyon all the way on the other side and I live in Ivan's. Right. And so I think I would still take Red Hills Parkway. I think I'd still get off on St. George Boulevard and go up a thousand and go around Red Hills Parkway. I'd probably still go that route. Um, but as population grows in Washington, especially with the development going on the North side of Washington Parkway and the couple hundred that maybe a thousand homes are going to be going up there when you get an added population up into green springs in that area that is primed and moving with development right now i can see how it would relieve some traffic from from that area but it's still further down the road mm -hmm. right piece piece to it but i could i definitely don't disagree with it it seems an outdated approach to solving any significant traffic issues yeah for, especially for today's traffic issues maybe future additional traffic but but today's i don't think it solves much at all so i agree yeah with you we're there. talking so 2000 was was the first time it was rejected that was that was before people had cell phones that was before that before a lot of people had cell phones before the iphone mm -hmm. so much has changed in the way we what we understand about transportation planning since then and, and probably it, a third of the homes in the green springs kind of as you go up the hill probably only a third of those homes had even been developed i think it probably ended right there at where the golf course kind of ends, that's probably where the first, you know, homes had even been built right there. Washington Parkway was a, uh, probably hadn't even be, been considered at that point. Yeah. Right. So our community has changed so much since then. Yeah. It's, it's, it's time to think about different, different ways that we can, that we can move people. And instead of thinking about how do we move cars, thinking about how we can move people more effectively, how can we, um, how can we build a little more more dense, more inward instead of outward? Why why do you think why do you think that there's such this push for it? Why why do you what do you think there what's the 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 amount of tension attention and focus they put on this? Why do you think they do that? I would ask Washington County that next time you have Eric on board. Um it, do it, it just doesn't make sense to to so many people. I think there are some um, there are some people who will benefit financially from from the Northern Quarter Highway Road. It allow you know for more development and in the Washington area and more of those parcels that butt up against the the Red Cliffs Desert Reserve and National Conservation Area. But um, it's, it seems like they would develop anyway, though, right? Without whether this road is there or not, they develop anyway. Perhaps, right? Yeah. 
Yeah. So let me go back to to the kind of the timeline of what yeah. happened. So in in 2020, finally the the right people were were in place um, to push through this uh, this idea that had failed six times before. And a, they started an environmental assessment, uh, environmental impact statement study over, it was pushed through a 13-month period, which is really unheard of for, for a project of this size, for a project with this much controversy. So they'd already done an environmental impact study on it? Nope. So this, this was 2020. So it's, it started in, um, I believe, in, in January of 2020 through January of 2021, something along that. It was 13, a 13 month period of when the Bureau of Land Management studied the the Northern Quarter Highway and all of its impacts on the environment. And then along with that, that's when we got some other alternatives along the way that they, that they studied alongside of that. So the studies that had happened before that, they weren't environmental impact studies? No, this was the first time a, a, a study had been done. Okay, so then in the in the previous, um, uh, I guess, attempts to push it forward, the only environmental impact studies on the turtle were independent. So this is just oh, the good first question. time. I see what you're saying. Um, so environmental impact study is a is like a the NEPA process. The NEPA process. The NEPA process. Yeah, there were um, the other times it was through. Fish and Wildlife Service or the agencies, biologists shut it down earlier and said, you know, no, this will be biologically devastating. But it was it was my understanding is that this was the first full blown NEPA process or environmental. So, impact so those were specific to the like the Mojave Desert tortoise because it was it's classified as an endangered species and the other sensitive species that are around. So it was just really. The Department of Natural Wildlife, I think, yeah, the the Fish and Game, they they did their own study, so it was like the preliminary study. But the NEPA process comes in to uh, play once there's basically like, hey, we have like a, a legitimate plan here. Now we have to check this box. So then the state files with that as a, you know, it's another you know step along the way, and you're saying it. it they did it over 13 months. How long do they normally take? So what, what triggered it was Washington County went um, decided to submit an application for the right-of-way for the highway. Okay. So that's what kicked off the environmental impact statement. Technically, it's submitted through the, the Utah Department of Transportation okay. um, to the Bureau of Land Management. And um, yeah, usually we see this being, being a multi-year process. Right. Um, we have some other projects in the area that are that are taking uh, that are less controversial that are taking a lot more time than that right now Mm -hmm. um and so um the public comment period for this was uh during ran the two weeks it covered two of the weeks during um christmas and new year's and it also overlapped with the lake powell pipeline public comment period Mm -hmm. so there was kind of this this push to Get it through really quickly. 2021 was coming up fast. 2021 was coming up fast. Um, It sidestepped a lot of normal procedures that they would do. It ignored thousands of comments. Um, All these fires ripped through in 2020 and um, thousands of people said, hey, wait a minute, we need to back up and and fix the analysis. This is substantial enough that we need to we need to pause and we need to reevaluate how this changes kind of the situation on the ground. Um, but it was pushed through anyway. And then in the, the final days, literally the final days of the Trump administration, it was signed and approved. Mm-hmm. And then um, quickly after that, Conserve Southwest Utah and, and a couple of other groups, uh, both statewide and nationally, sued the Department of Interior, the, so the Bureau of Land Management and the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. Um, we cited five bedrock um, environmental laws, including the Endangered Species Act, but also something called the Land Water Conservation Fund Act. And that's because $20 million of taxpayer money was used to purchase land in the Red Cliffs area in Zone 3 um, in areas that would be destroyed by by the, the proposed Northern Court Highway. Mm-hmm. So this taxpayer money was used to to protect this place for recreation, for habitat. 
and that that area would be destroyed. So that that was one of our one of our points. And eventually, so it took took a couple of years to to go through the the legal process. Um, last fall, we we settled. I know Eric Clark called it a backroom deal, which is an interesting choice of words. I think. Um, I think most people would prefer to to settle when they're in a in a in a lawsuit. Um, I think anytime you can have the parties agree and come together on a solution outside of court and not waste judicial resources, not waste taxpayer money, uh, save years of time without going through the court, then that's the the preferred way to do it. Um, so yeah, we got a faster resolution. We we saved saved resources in the end. And um, I do want to make a comment about the the lawyer fees, I think. So the Bureau of Land Management admitted to doing some things incorrectly the first time. Okay. They admitted to, uh, d- they said they had deficiencies in analysis, legal errors. Um, so they, they admitted, they got caught. Um, and anytime you, you, uh, you lose a case, it's, it's pretty normal to pay, to pay legal fees. Right. Um, so there was nothing abnormal with, with the normal, with the legal fees that were, that came out of the settlement. Yeah. Okay. Fair enough. Fair enough. Yeah. That this, yeah, the money, the money involved is also the other thing that I'm just trying to rattle around in my head is wh- wh- where's this funding coming from? Like I, uh, I can't help but think, Funding on both sides, both sides of this this discussion, because millions you know, of dollars have been spent millions. on the Northern Quarter Highway issue over the last over twenty plus years. Millions of dollars, millions, and yet we're still continuing to push for it. And yeah. um, and on the one side, so I don't even know what where, where does Conserve Southwest Utah get their funding. So we're, we get mo- about half of our funding comes from individual donations from community members who support our cause. And then the other half come from grants for projects that we're working on from foundations, from things like that. Mm-hmm. Okay. So grants from the federal government, state government? Um, right now we have a grant with the Bureau of Land Management to do some stewardship projects in the Beaver Dam Wash okay. National Conservation Area. So we have a team of volunteers who go out there and who restore the habitat and who also have some some trail cameras out there who are who are looking and monitoring for some sensitive species and doing some research for for the Bureau of Land Management. Okay. Got it. That makes sense. So then the basically the the legal fees and things like that, the assumption is well we're going to win the case and then the the settlement for who wins the case pays for or the the loser pays the the legal fees typically is that is that right? I mean that's typical of of lawsuits, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. So so they pay. <laughs> so the I guess the um the plaintiff I guess are you? We're we, the plaintiffs. Yeah, the mm-hmm. the plaintiffs are um resting on the fact that we're going to put this effort into it, knowing that we have a case that we can win, and so that you know the funding is going to come you know at the end to be able to pay for all of this. Pay for the attorney, right? Yeah. Pay for the attorney, right? So then um. Going back to, we were on a timeline. I got, we got sidetracked again. So we were on a timeline. Um, remind me where we were at. So we, we settled. Um, we settled. Oh, that's And settlement. as part of that settlement agreement, the, so the Bureau of Land Management admitted to some deficiencies in their initial 2020, 2021 study. Mm-hmm. And they said, okay, you're right. Um, we didn't do some things that we should have done. So we're going to go back and do what's called a supplemental study or supplemental environmental impact statement. And then that's where we came up with a couple of different alternatives, right? That's kind of actually those, um, no new alternatives have been studied since 2020. Okay. Got it. So those alternatives came about, um, in the 2020 process, um, the EIS NEPA process that happened Mm -hmm. and, Um, those were actually based, um, so conserve Southwest, conserve Southwest Utah had suggested a number of alternatives to the Northern quarter highway. Um, two of those are the, the ones that were carried forward, which is the Red Hills Parkway expansion. So taking a road that already exists and making it capable of moving, moving cars better. Mm -hmm. And then the one way couplet idea. 
And then, so um, those two ideas were basically proposed by Conserve Southwest Utah. Yep, okay. along with a number of other ones. The, those were the only ones that the Bureau of Land Management moved forward with with studying as alternatives. Okay, and um, it's important to note that those are those are conceptual alternatives. Right. And um, Eric Clark, I know, mentioned in the last podcast that he took the that the county took those conceptual alternatives, plug them into the computer algorithm and it spit out, you know, one viable way of making yeah, it work. I think just the two, the two viable ways, but two, yeah, yeah, yeah the one couple. viable way for each. each yeah. Of right. Those, right. Right. And so unlike the, I should have stopped in there. We were running out of time. I should have stopped in the very, like, why did we go to a computer about solving this? Why didn't, why didn't a human, t- there was no human element in a conceptual way that we could have spent a little bit more time to say from an actual human who exists in the world cantilevers off the side of the cliff and yeah the, yeah the computer running it through the computer right well that must be good right it's like oh i went to the internet the internet said this it must must work it, it seems like a it, there wasn't a lot of effort put into this alternative is what i what right I, and why are we spending millions of dollars on an important issue on an issue that's so important to our community and letting a computer spit out an option for us like yeah you know it's it's it's, but the point really is that it was a conceptual alternative Uh to to kind of study is is there another option that Mm -hmm. works that could work Mm -hmm. um it was kind of a proof of concept thing is Mm -hmm. there a way that we can move people so that we don't need to destroy the precious area do Mm -hmm. we don't need to destroy the bread cliffs what were the what were the was there some like limitations when you presented a few of your ideas to the Bureau of Land Man- Management? What I guess what helped them settle on these two is the only two that they accepted. Maybe maybe help me some some of the other yeah. ideas. That- so I wasn't around then, but what Eric Clark told us recently is that they just moved forward with the ones that were easiest for their computer model to to input into their computer model and model as alternatives. Hmm. So, okay. So do you, do you know of any of the other concepts or alternatives? I could, I could get them for you, but I'm just, just curious if you had thought yeah, of it was any. before my time. So, um, those, those two didn't seem like they made any sense to me, at least as he described them, especially the one way couplet around, uh, St. George funneling traffic through the downtown. Um, I know there's a, a, a growing, perspective of making St. George like a walkable, like vibrant community where if we, we give the cars, the, the space, they take up every, all of the space, right? When this goes back to the same point and, and, and I get your point about the Northern corridors, like you're just giving cars more space that uh, we shouldn't be giving them. So it's trading one, one perspective for the other, but both same problem. So trying to come up to a consensus or, a, a um, uh, I guess, uh, drawing a blank on the word, but, uh, uh, concession, but it's, it's not, um, I, it doesn't, we don't want to lose, lose, right. I don't think that makes any sense. It, it should be a win, win. So he had brought up zone six and the trade off for zone six. What, what was your, what's your perspective or what, what is your organization's perspective on the trade off? Was that not a, a win, win scenario by doing it that way? So let me back up a little bit. So in, um, let's go to 2019. So pre, pre this environmental uh-huh. study process, um, Bear Claw Poppy was there. Moe's Valley was there. All half of the land over there. Um, in zone six. In yeah. zone six area. It's back behind Bloomington. So, um, correct. Thank you. So zone six area, half of that. Um, so it's about 7,000 acres. Um, zone six Zone six, the name didn't exist. That right. that land was there, um, but the the land that is now called Zone six, about half of that is Bureau of Land Management mm-hmm. land. So it's protected in perpetuity, no matter what. Period. Doesn't matter if the highway goes through or gets denied. Um, it, it's there. It'll be protected. It's the highest level of protection we have for for public lands. The other half of that is the Sitla land, and that's that's the land that's that's currently in question. Um, but back in, in, in 2019, so before this environmental process went on, those, those places existed, nobody was threatening to, to develop or sell off the Sitla land over mm-hmm. there. No one, no one was concerned about that. Um, but fast forward to 2020, 
2021. Uh, that's when the Northern Quarter Highway w- was approved. It's it's since been remanded back to the BL- BLM. Um, but when it was approved, the the part of the approval process was okay. Acknowledging that you've um, you're going to build this highway through through what's called Zone Three of Red Cliffs Desert Reserve, you're going to destroy critical habitat for the desert tortoise. So, as a way to mitigate for that, not totally offset, but to mitigate for for some of that damage that's being done, then here you can have this this land over here. We'll add that to the Red Cliffs Desert Reserve. We'll call it Zone Six. Red Cliffs Desert Reserve now has has zones one, two, three, four, five, six. Mm-hmm. Um, so that was added added in, and um, I think the the frustrating thing is now listening to Washington County wave threats around about how if the highway is rejected this time around that 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 area would would be open for development. I think that that it's not an automatic process. Mm -hmm. Um, I think that it ignores some things that we could be doing. We we could be coming. I would like to be coming together and talking about ways that we can protect the the special places of zone six, the areas that are so important to so many members of our community. Yeah. Um, And it's, it's zone six is not a bargaining chip. It's not something that we can hold up in the air should be holding up in the air and saying, isn't this place wonderful? It's beautiful it has all these climbing resources and mountain biking trails which by the way i love bear claw poppy i Mm -hmm. bike there frequently um do you want to protect this place well the only way to protect this place is if you destroy this other place over here and you put a highway over here that that doesn't make sense to to so many people and that that doesn't have to be the way it is it's not an either or solution you know we we can come together as a community and and find a way to protect protect the places so from the onset of that proposal of creating zone six, that wasn't something that you were, or your organization was really wanting to do. That wasn't, that wasn't, that didn't feel like something that was a, a concession from well, the county. I mean, zone six is a, zone six contains a lot of great resources and recreation resources and habitat resources and things that of course we would like to see protected. Absolutely. Was it a fair trade-off for it? Does it make does it make it worth it to put a highway through another area? No, it's not. It's not a bargaining chip. It's not. Um, it's not something that we can throw around like that. So, is there? So, from your perspective, even if we were to relocate the tor- the tortoises that are in Zone Three, if we were to do everything that we could to uh, mitigate any of the damage, is there a trade-off area? space is looking throughout the county of all the different you know blm land and uh, and uh, and otherwise right because there's sitla land all over the place as well still so is there any zone that's worth trading for that good question from your perspective yeah so i think there's a there's a couple issues at play so it's it's more than just the tortoise right Uh um but we'll start with the tortoise when you when you move the tortoise somewhere that's that's very different than keeping it in its original habitat right and um you know the county said well we'll put culverts in to help the tortoises move under the highway Tor- uh, culverts have been shown to only be five to t- 15 percent effective at connecting hi- at habitat connectivity um but it, it's it's more than just the tortoise it's it's all those recreation areas it's the cultural resources. It's the increased fire um, frequency in that area. Um, so I, I'm maybe there. There's an area somewhere. It's probably significantly more land than what would be destroyed from the Northern Quarter Highway, and it would take a lot of people coming together to figure out as a community. Okay, what? What area is important to protect? What are we willing to to lose? There's going to be trade offs mm-hmm. one way or the other. You know what what's important to us. Mm-hmm. So the the consideration for the trade off is isn't really a consideration at this point for your organization for Conserve Southwest Utah. It's certainly something we'd be willing to talk about. Yeah, it's not the current process that's going on is not evaluating that. 
Yeah, I think I think one of the gaps, and and I didn't I didn't take the opportunity to to discuss with Eric either was, you know, Sitla and Bureau of Land Management. They they trade land. They like to trade land. So there's not really it's not always just you sell that land to a developer and then they just develop it. They a lot of times they'll take this land and they'll move it and they'll say oh, we'll give you this Sitla land and we'll take this land over here from the Bureau of Land Management and they do they do trades. So having that zone be protected uh, makes that Sitla land significantly less valuable because the trade-off, right, could be Sitla decides, well, we're going to trade that land for land over here, right, that impacts a different part of the community and it causes, you know, potentially more habitat to be destroyed or something like that. Right. So actually the, uh, protecting an area increases its value. So it's, it's actually more valuable for Sitla. So the land in zone six is, is more valuable if it's protected, protected as a Red Cliffs desert reserve. Well, so if, if I was to, if I was to trade it for, so, so if it, if it had the zone six overlay on top of it being a, a NCA, which it, it currently doesn't, or it, it wouldn't, if we were to scrap the whole, Arrangement. Zone six is not part of the National Conservation Area, just to be clear. There's, it, so there's it two be in different there. there's two different things. It's really confusing. Um, this is why we need a podcast to talk about yeah, it. Yeah, multiple podcasts. Yeah, right. <laughs> so um Red Cliffs Desert Reserve, that's the thing that was designated in nineteen ninety five. Okay. And that's managed by the county. Okay. Um that's sixty two thousand give or take acres. Okay. In 2009, the NCA set aside a subset of that, just 45,000 acres. Okay. Um, and that's mostly the, the the northern area, zone three. And the purpose uh, and the of that, the purpose of that was for what? Extra, extra protection. Because the the conservation area allowed for development. What what, what was the extra protection that it lit, that it added to it? I guess. Uh, What's the difference between the two? Great question. Um, I think that Eric kind of gave a good historical context to to what was happening in the community around that time. That that uh, it it made it it gives it extra extra protection. So it's now uh, managed by the Bureau of Land Management. It um, I can't I don't know specifically what it is the other than the two differences. Then it, it makes it more challenging to, there's less things that you can do on a national conservation area land. Okay. The, um, it's kind of protected for it's, it's, it goes back to that conservation mandate that, mm-hmm. that I read out of it's protected for these, these scenic and other, um, natural and cultural resource values. So they, they kind of get, get more weight than they did as just, um, the Red Cliffs Desert Reserve. So the so Zone Six, it was added to the Red Cliffs Desert Reserve, which is managed by the county, but it was not added to the National Conservation Area. Okay. So, um, <laughs> so following all that complicated. Yeah, so so just because um, I'm trying to understand how it's it's not valuable to. I understand the 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 other points, the fire and the the petroglyphs and the things that are over there, um, preserving those things the preservation of zone six isn't quite acceptable, acceptable from your perspective because it was already protected, I think is what you had said, or like it was, it already had the highest protection, but I guess I just, I misunderstood that is how is that protected because whether zone six exists or not. Super complicated. Okay. So half of zone six, that, that area that's uh-huh. now part of the reserve, that's so the, Red Cliffs Desert Reserve is is kind of managed by Washington County, but it's it's um, a lot of land in there is owned and managed by different groups. Okay. So in in this case, half of that land is is managed and owned by the federal government. The federal government by the Bureau of Land Management, and it's actually a designated what's called a ACEC or Area of Critical Environmental Concern. And that's because of the um, dwarf bear claw poppy and some other, and the Mojave desert tortoise and Mm -hmm. other sensitive things. And so that's, that area is, is owned by BLM. It will not, uh, you know, be, unless they trade for something else, it Mm -hmm. will not ever be, um, there's certain thing, they have to protect all of the, the species on there and they have to protect the values of why it was created on there. Mm -hmm. The other half of that, but it doesn't make it immune to development. It doesn't. No, it is. It. it, I mean, they could 
theoretically traded out, um, but it would take an Im- immense amount of um, environmental NEPA process and environmental impact statement process and other complicated things. Okay. Um, and so it's, 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 a uh, we consider that protected in perpetuity. Okay. Um, the other half is, is Sitla, the Sitla land. Sitla land. And they have a mandate to get the most money for that land, no matter what it is, the, right. the highest dollar value that they can get for the property. Their mandate is to either develop it or trade it for a place that could be developed. Right. Right. And so the hope is that that Sitla continues to hold on to that land and that that someone is able to we as a community are able to get the resources to to trade out the the places that are special to us and to protect those areas because they definitely deserve to be protected. OK, there are, you know, um, the, the community would see such a giant outcry. You, you think that the reaction to the Northern Quarter Highway was was uh, was big and lots of people, lots of voices were heard. Um, if we tried to develop, if 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 the community, if Washington County tried to develop um, Mose Valley or Bear Claw Poppy, there would be such public outcry. And and so there, we really have an opportunity here to to speak out and to protect those places and to find a long term plan to protect those in perpetuity. Mm-hmm. And so um, it's important to note that even with the Zone Six designation those SITLA lands are not protected in perpetuity. The BLM lands are, but the Zone 6 lands are not. SITLA assigned a, a, an agreement. It's not a binding agreement. They could pull out hypothetically at any time. We hope they won't, but they could. They could, they, they could, they uh, do they could develop that land. And so even with zone six, the, the even with, that designation, even or, with the zone six designation. Okay. And so that's why it feels like, they're, we're trading one, one out, you know, the, the, the point that Eric was making that if we, if we unroll what happened in 2019, 2020, 2019, 2020, 2021. Mm-hmm. If, if we unroll that, we unroll zone six, therefore it opens the door to v- development. But your position is that it's the door, the door is still open anyway. Right. So even closing that door though, uh, doesn't feel, still doesn't feel like enough. Is that your stance? Yeah. Fair enough. Fair enough. So th- thinking of these all other alternatives, what, what other alternatives, let's assume we, we move forward. we go through this public com- comment period that we're going through now there by the end of this year, the, the ruling has been, we're going to make a decision by the first of the year, right? I think it's January one or December 31st. We're going to make a decision. Yeah. It's a, it's by November, by November. And if it goes the way of killing the project, what are you anticipating happens next? So if, if the right away for the highway is rejected, is rejected, what do you think is going to happen after that? So the Washington County just last week, um, I don't know if you saw they they announced a notice of intent to sue the Bureau of Land Management and the Fish and Wildlife Service. Um, And so we can, and they've been pretty forthcoming about that, as as the path they would take if the if the right of way is a pr- is excuse me is a rejected is rejected. Um, so that that you you anticipate that's what they're going to do file suit, and then we just run that more legal. Yeah, battles. And we're we're confident that our position is strong, and that even if Washington County were to sue Department of Interior again, that. Um, that we would win, that the Department of Interior w- would win because of all the, there's five bedrock environmental laws that the Northern Quarter Highway violates. Mm, okay. And then if, if you, if there's a, a victory and the, the e- easement is given, mm-hmm. what, what would be the next step from there? Likely we would consider reopening our lawsuit again, because we feel confident that, that the proposed road is illegal. So, so could you, based on new grounds, like there's new, new grounds, cause you can't, we couldn't just keep suing based off the same reasoning, right? So we could, yeah. So we, we could, uh, reopen, we, we could reopen based on the same reason, same reason. And then we just go through it all over again, just in repeat. We just be in the groundhog day. Yeah. And so we're, we're trying to think about, okay, 
we're spending millions of dollars on a community on this right. on this issue that nobody wants. That sorry, that uh, some elected I think a officials lot, it's, want. I, I think I think there's a there's a lot, and this is one of the questions I asked Eric is like, how do you get people that are in favor of it? Because I I have I have had some messages and comments about being in favor of it. Um, so there is there is definitely a portion of the group, but I always I always think um, there's always less um voc- less people are vocal about it when they feel like well if the county is behind it and a bunch of these elected officials are behind the northern corridor Celeste Malloy and most of the state representatives that are serving or Washington County they all seem to be in support of the northern corridor the county being one of them i think the commissioners are uh, probably unanimous in in wanting the corridor to to move forward I think a lot of those people are like, well, it seems like we have all the representation we need. Public comment isn't necessarily, I'm, I'm not so passionate about it that I'm going to get out and, and comment on it. So the, uh, the opposition seems to always get the most uh, vocal, it seems like in these, these moments. But knowing that there's that, that push forward to it, um, it seems like the intent wouldn't be to want to go back through the legal process because it's expensive. Right. And there's, there's a big movement towards it. So the finding a win-win to where we wouldn't have to go through this again, is there another attempt at coming up with a different solution, even if it's more expensive? Yeah. So I'd push back a little bit on your argument that because uh, people are not saying anything that that means that, that they're, in support of the highway or that your argument, I guess, is that because there are all these bureaucrats and elected officials advocating for the highway, that they don't need to voice their opinion. And that's why we're not seeing very many people express support for the Northern Quarter Highway. But or maybe we, they're just apathetic. Maybe, or maybe they're just, just apathetic. Care. But what we've seen time and time again, so um, there hasn't been a, a recent survey to my knowledge, but back in 2010, again, you know, Way updated, yeah. but um, 64%. So the spectrum did a survey of the community and 64% of people were in uh, against the highway were in support of protecting red cliffs and were against the highway. Mm-hmm. And then in all of the public comment periods that we've had so far, we've seen thousands of comments come in in support of protecting red cliffs in, in opposition to the highway. We've seen, um, we had a recent field day hearing in April that um, was mostly about the Northern Quarter Highway. Other than uh, the the bureau, the, it, m- most of the people who were there in attendance were in support of protecting Red Cliffs, and they did not want to see the highway. The the most of the rest of the audience were were bureaucrats or elected officials or government officials or people who needed to be there. And then we've seen the same thing at a lot of the the BLM has had open houses um, a couple times now as part of their ongoing environmental. Uh, process and most of the people who come and who ask questions and who comment are people who do not want the highway. Mm-hmm. So I okay. think I think the will of the the people in this community are is is let's protect this place that's so special that is the crowning jewel of our community and and we have a bunch of bureaucrats who who are just have their heads in the sand who want this thing that's been t- been trying to be pushed since early two thousand that's out it's an outdated vision. Mm-hmm. So. Um, yeah, I think there's no organization in favor of it. There's not like a big push, um, private organizations or nonprofit organizations in favor of of it. Right. Because, um, what, what value does it bring? It's, a there's not a lot of motivation to organize outside groups when, it seems like the bureaucracy or at least the government agencies are already in favor of it. Does that make sense? Yeah. And it's so it seems like cause the- it, it's weird. It's weird to me. It doesn't, it doesn't make a whole lot of sense, but just in organizing uh, to be against something for whatever reason, it seems like there's a lot more organization when you don't want something to happen. There's a lot of reasoning to, to fight it uh, versus uh, wanting something to happen for whatever reason. We don't, we don't get organized around a lot of things of, of wanting to see something push forward, especially when it comes to infrastructure type stuff, right? Whether it's uh, development of water treatment facilities, right? There's not a a big push for organizations outside of government to push for water infrastructure or to to push um, um, 
transportation. It's so boring. I, I've wanted to have so many conversations about transportation, but so many people, they want to be upset about the traffic, but then they don't, they don't want to organize around solving the traffic problem. They'll organize around not adding uh, roads, but you don't see any organizations of how do we make this better? It's just so odd. I don't know why. I guess it doesn't make sense to me. You're right that, that there's not a local nonprofit that is for the highway. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, but uh, Washington County has kind of taken up that charge. And if yeah. you've been to any trailhead in the last six months, you've probably seen a big sign um, with a QR code saying, saying, I believe their motto is save Red Cliffs. They kind of spun off of our protect Red Cliffs. <laughs> um, and it leads to a website that uh, bashes Conserve Southwest Utah. So this is county resources, taxpayer money going to uh, a page that uh, blames us for um, – for zone six, the threat to zone six and zone six being, mm. being put under the chopping block. And, um, it is kind of an odd thing for, for a County to be doing. Yeah. Uh, it, I think it used to be odd, but it seems more and more frequent where you have, uh, government organizations doing similar things like that. It seems that that's more of a, a standard at this stage than it was, uh, in years past, right? Attacking to, nonprofits. At, attack, attacking the uh, the opposition, right? Rather than serving the community a, as as kind of, I think you've well stated just the the surveys. I'm surprised there hasn't been an additional surveys done on the community the cu- community's viewpoint of this. Is that something that you find valuable other than the public comment piece? Do you, do you feel like a, a, an additional survey would, would be valuable? Yeah, I think a lot more education is needed too. I mean, you, you've you spent some time digging into this. You spend an hour with Eric, an hour with me, and it's it's a complicated issue. It's really hard for, for uh, someone from the community who's new to this, who's just seen bits here and there and talking points here and there. It's really hard to understand what's really at stake. And so I think it would be important to do, do a lot more community education before, before really getting an accurate representation of how the community feels about a project like this. But I will say that the, um, so those signs have been up at the trailheads, um, for I think believe since November, so over six months now, and they lead to a website that encourages people to reach out to Conserve Southwest Utah. It gives our phone number and our email address, and to express discontent with um, with the process that's going on and uh, come out in support of the highway. We have not received a single phone call or email, and so I think that that really tells you where where the community's heart is at. Yeah. They want to, they want to protect this place and yeah. they, they want to protect zone six too. Yeah. And we can do that. We can do both. What, um, I, I really, I really want to flush out what, what are some alternatives? Is, have, have you thought as a civil engineer, as somebody that's problem solving, what do you think if, if we were to just say the issues traffic in general, cause I think that's what I think the idea early on was like, Hey, we need to figure out a loop around. So we're not funneling. We have one freeway that just cuts cuts the, you know, greater St. George area right in half. We have a river, we have mm-hmm. plateaus everywhere. Where, what do you think is a transportation solution? So first off, I'm not a transportation engineer, so. That's okay. <laughs> I, I want to, don't want to claim to be. I'm not I'm either. Not. I'm actually not an expert in yeah. almost anything. So. <laughs> I, I think we need to, to start spending some of the money we've been spending on pushing for the Northern Quarter Highway on on getting some real experts together to come up with some solutions some people who are transportation or traffic engineers um not just you know spitting putting a concept into a computer model and spitting out one way that it possibly could work i think that um adding capacity to the red cliffs uh red cliffs parkway makes a lot of sense to me i i that's the my route of choice when i'm i live in here in santa clara that's my route of choice when I'm traveling mm-hmm. to that end of town. It makes there are some things that we can do to 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 make it build more, have, carry more cars uh, more efficiently. I uh, in your last podcast you mentioned some eminent domain issues. Um, that is not necessarily part of part of what needs to happen. I think it's important again to emphasize that it's that the 
that the, again, the computer model spit out one option of the way it could work. Mm -hmm. And if we were to build capacity to the Red Hills Parkway Expressway, we could work, we as a community would come together and think about, okay, what are the the things that we're willing to let go of? What are the things that, that must stay? And it, it doesn't necessarily have to involve buyout of personal property or businesses. Mm-hmm. Um, so I, wa- I wanted to make that really clear that eminent domain does not need to be a part of this process. So you, your thought would be expand on Red Hills Parkway? And yeah, expand on the infrastructure that we, that we already have. Mm-hmm. So um, making roads wider... It's it's a it's a very California thing to do is make uh just add a couple more lanes and then we no so uh, excuse me I don't I don't actually mean to make Red Hills Parkway wider okay <laughs> I think there are ways that we can m- move cars more efficiently um, I think that there are ways that we can um, you know uh, maybe if it maybe um, so part of the Parkway Expressway plan is to connect cars directly to I-15. Okay. And that's one of the ways that was modeled. Um, maybe maybe it makes sense to connect it there where St. George Boulevard is. Maybe it makes sense to have some kind of underpass overpass over on Mall Drive, mm-hmm. kind of a little further further away. Um, to, to me, that feels like a natural place to have cars come in and out. Um I think that there that we really have an opportunity here to think about moving moving people and to think about access differently than than the way we've been doing it. Um, again, we we don't want to fall back on this outdated way, outdated thinking. This this um, this highway plan that's that's twenty thirty years old. Um, we now understand a lot of things about how when we add highways, when we um, add lanes to things, it actually, it doesn't really help us in the long run. It just induces more growth. People, it induces more, de- um, more cars and more demand for, for people. Um, we, we saw that with, with Bluff Street. I think, you know, we spent a lot of time and, and energy increasing the capacity of Bluff Street. And um, yes, we're able to move more cars. And, but now we see more cars on Bluff Street and increased the capacity. And then we've seen a lot of a lot of the connecting roads around it have um, have felt the, the the impacts to that. So we're putting pressure instead of Bluff Street having pressure, we're we're kind of moving the pressure around. And so we need to think about um, kind of back up and big picture of how do we move um, humans? How do we move humans and how do we encourage active transportation? How do we make our, it's, you know, St. George's downtown area has been, has been moving in the right direction. They're doing a good job of making the area more walkable, more friendly to pedestrians, um, adding more bike lanes. There's still a long way to go. Mm -hmm. Um, and a long way to go is especially in the areas outside of St. George. Um, but, um, you see a lot of people moving into that area now, um, you see the, the, the space above farmstead bakery and mm-hmm. that, that mixed Plaza, use development. Five over ones. Yep. Mm-hmm. That's been extremely successful and they're, that's a desirable place to live because it's so walkable and that's, that's, that's considered a high density. And that's, that's, um, that's something that we could implement more of so that people are closer to the resources that they, that they want right. closer to grocery stores, closer to bakeries. So what, uh, what's your analysis, at least on the, I guess, maybe you haven't ho- thought a whole lot about, because uh, uh, our public transportation at, as a county is abysmal. It's abysmal. Um, has there, ha- have, do you know of any additional studies other than just roadways to increase? Because public transportation isn't, it doesn't ever make money. It never makes money. It's a, it's a utility, essentially where it's uh, subsidi- subsidized by the, the greater community in order to move people around more efficiently. But that it, but it's so in, are cars. So, so are cars. It's just the, the freedom of being able to jump in your car and go do it. But if, you know, I, I've, you know, traveled all over the world, been to lots of different cities. Some transportation cities are great. Some of them are awful. Um, but the ones that are the best are the ones with the most options, right? Whether it's buses or trams or, you know, whatever it is, there's access to those public transportation areas in general. 
I want to call attention to one thing that you said during the podcast yeah, with Eric please. Clark. So I was, I was surprised to hear you say that we can't really sprawl here because 75% of our land is owned by the federal government. Okay. And I thought, well, maybe I, maybe I don't have the right definition of sprawl. So I went and looked at the Smart Growth America website. Um, mm-hmm. And so I, I would argue that that uh, with the except with the exception of St. George downtown, which has has been moving in the right direction, that uh, the rest of our community does uh, meets meets this definition of sprawl, which is there's five key points: low density development, separated homes, shops, and workplaces, roads marked by huge blocks and poor access, lack of a thriving downtown center or town center. And low walkability or lack of transportation choices other than cars, and so I, I think we we have a long long way to go to there, the, which I I think is a hopeful message. Mm-hmm. You know, we we have so many areas where we can improve, where we can grow more inwardly, and where we can create create a more livable area for for people to live. And and by doing so, we can um, increase the walkability, increase the bikeability, um, increase the way improve the way we move people around and give them better access to the resources they need. And by doing that, we can, we can reduce our, our, our need for, for, to move cars around and for new highways. And we can rely on the existing roads that we already have and make sure that we protect the precious places that we all love in, in the meantime. Yeah, no, I I don't disagree with you there. And, and to, to your point, my, my thought on, we're going to reach the boundaries of when I think of sprawl, I can't help but think of like Victorville, California, where 80% of the residents in Victorville, California travel between 30 and 40 minutes to work. It's, it's the longest travel distance of any uh, city in the country. And when I, when I think of sprawl, I think of that, right. Where Los Angeles County, Orange County, and, and most of Riverside County, um, got so populated so quickly that the sprawl happened, the, the urban, you know, the suburban experiment sprawled into where you had these big cities where there was really no, no, uh, no jobs, just homes. And then they have to travel a really long distance to get in is that we're, we're in an Island, we're on an Island. Right. And so this idea that, you know, sprawling out to where we can, um, disperse the population over a large landmass. We don't really have that option. We, we really only have density is the, is really the only solution in my mind is, is getting more dense to your point and the vision, vision Dixie. And I, I covered this with uh, the Stacy young episode. This is early on when we started doing it, which I recommend anybody go back and listen to, cause he talks about zoning and, and some of the challenges that we have here and why we got to where we are is specifically what you said is the low density, um, big, large, track home developments, which is really all we've, we've left open at this point, right? There's not really the node type design of those thoughts in that vision Dixie back in the, back in the day was higher concentration of community spaces. I I want you to read that again, but it's, that was the idea. And we did the opposite of that. We didn't do that. We did big housing track units with no commercial around it, tough to get anywhere other than to drive. And the fields and little valleys, the kind of the case study that we dive deep into, because he was in the thick of it in those in the days of of the early developments of that. And so to your point, you're right. Yeah, we my my perspective on we can't sprawl as much as other communities or other areas have sprawled because of our restricted uh, private land that we can even develop on, which I didn't even know was was restricted all the way to the desert tortoise. I didn't realize our entire county has to have a permit to be able to develop period because of the, the endangered species that we have here. I didn't realize how important that act in itself is, is to develop anywhere in the county is contingent upon us protecting that tortoise. Right. And that was very fascinating to me and, and very interesting. So, you know, the idea of developing with with the turtle, we don't get a choice. We don't have a choice. We have to protect these public lands, especially the the best parts of them, right? And the great thing is that when we protect the land for the tortoise, we're protecting it for ourselves too. True. For our families, for our recreation. Yeah. And I I always just come back to the point where once we're full, we're going to be full, right? It's, it's, a, it's an island. It's Hawaii, right? Once, once all those private 
parcels are developed, that's what we get. Once we build it, that's what we get. There's not really a whole lot of adjusting around that. And if we, we do it in an improper way or in a poor way, it's, uh, it's going to lead to an explosion of housing prices. If we have, if we've had one now, it's the, the ceiling is infinite. It can just keep going up. And, and once we're full, those housing values and those property values are going to continue to rise, if not an accelerated rate. So once, once we, once we build it, that's, that's what we're going to end up getting. So to your point, once we build this road, we got a road there and we're going to have to deal with whatever the second and third intended unintended consequences arise from that. And I appreciate you coming on to, to talk through some of that stuff too, but is there anything else that we missed that's really important that um, the community understands or recognizes about this and, and why we need to pick a different, different option? Well, I really appreciate you reaching out to us and recognizing that, that the first round was, was a little, was one-sided yeah, and for sure. reaching out and trying to, to educate yourself and your listeners too, and to get, to get a perspective of, of this really complex issue. Yeah, of course. Yeah. This, the, as much as the people will say that I, 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 I can't be completely unbiased because we're all biased to some perspective, but I do want to try to, to get the story out as, as best I can to the whole of the story, not just to one side of it. So thanks for coming on. I appreciate you doing it. Thank you so much. All right. Have a good day. We'll thanks. see you guys. Thanks. Thanks for tuning in guys. We'll see you out there.